people in these, say, shops doing DevOps well are using. Yeah, we only have an hour. Um, so probably the first tool people relate to DevOps is uh, configuration management. Um, it's actually a kind of um, language or configuration language that allows you to put uh, operating systems or machines into a known state. Um, if you were to have a traditional shell script that does something on one machine, that's fine. But it might not work on, uh, you know, one on Ubuntu, on CentOS, and so on. So these tools, for one thing, they've abstracted away things like package management. So you just say install Apache, whatever the package is called, Apache 2, or whatever. It's kind of abstracted away. So that's one thing it does. In instead of only taking care of the initial installation of a server, it manages the whole life cycle of the server. So how it does that, it keeps on running the same script over and over again to put the machine converging to the state that you actually want. So that's the difference between just automating the initial install and keeping managing the systems. Um, the way it's expressed seems like code and people put the infrastructure as code label onto it and with it, becomes a whole set of like versioning control, testing, everything that we were asking from developers to take care of, like to, to make sure that code runs, now is being applied to things like managing the server. So that's kind of the first category of configuration management tools, like CF Engine, Puppet Chef, Ansible, SaltStack. So there's continuously coming new tools kind of start taking that approach on defining your systems, what needs to be on there, instead of just setting scripts and running them uh, once or maybe twice on execution. So, so maybe an important thing to add there is that most of those tools actually also allow you to all the changes and to enforce the state so that intrusions are being detected pretty quickly because you have a trail of who managed what, when, where by default. You get that for free, at least for the files you are managing there. So I have a question related to this. Who here has to deal with Six Sigma? Anyone? Okay. What about ITIL? Ha ha. What, what, what about ITIL? Basil. You know, these all require a lot of measuring metrics, policy enforcement, process, and but the thing is, none of these require a lot of bureaucracy. What they require is consistent, regular, measurable process. ISO, we all deal with this crap all the time. This may, you know, things like DevOps and automation do that. They give you the ability to demonstrate all of these things with a lot less bureaucracy than you've been doing it before. You're getting rid of that manual crap. Well, uh, and, on and you're the, generating those metrics automatically as well. Right. On the tools side, um, this isn't a vendor plug, but um, I love Jira and Confluence, right? Right. Um, because they help with that cultural aspect and I get the benefit of documentation and I get the benefit of metrics. Even just velocity metrics are uh, out of Jira are just beautiful. Right, and you, fog bugs and I mean, these modern ticket management systems are tremendous for generating a lot of this right. stuff. Right. And I mean, this is, as, as dirty words as those are, we're dealing with them and get rid of the bureaucracy wherever you can means you can go a lot faster. So. One thing over the last couple of years that proved the success of these tools was the fact that um, they became self-servicing. Like a developer could install a new system as it was defined, as it was supposed to be. Um, the tests were running and monitoring check where the systems was up. So I'm kind of challenging the security world on driving at the same thing. Like, the admin, the sysadmin used to be that special guy, you know, with the beard saying, I know these things, I'll fix it for you. Um, often in security, I see a similar thing, like I'm a security guy, I'm knowledgeable in whatever vulnerabilities, I can do that stuff, I, I know how all these things work. Imagine you build a system 
that is kind of self-servicing and embedded in the workflow of developers and people working in your company. So think about contributing to that life cycle instead of being the one outside the loop just criticizing it. So that's kind of a point I, I want to make. So if you achieve that, I'm happy to hear your story because that's great. But often I see it up to a point like you're the special snowflake as a security person in a company that knows the stuff. So, so when you can give those developers a platform self-service which is managed by you as a security person, you won't run into the fact that they on their local machines have disabled as a Linux and when you run into production, you run into all the other Linux problems because you've actually defined upfront the platform they are going to work with and it's automated and it's easy for them to use. A, a, a very quick pile on that cultural integration that you speak of. When, when you start to achieve that, from a risk management standpoint, it's actually much more important, right? Because now I can start to s talk about financial value and financial impact in the same um, in the same conversation, in the same documentation, it allows me to do that versus what most risk programs do is like, oh, well, here's a billion things that could go wrong and they're all red and it's terrible, right? I can say, well, you know, let's make some financial decisions driven by, you know, loss distributions versus time to market, paying down technical debt, all of the benefits that, that our DevOps process gives us. Maybe yeah, I can if, I, if I wind up with Sorry. two of these, I'm not doing my job. Um, yeah. Okay, just so I want to open up the last half for audience questions. Why don't we just let everybody okay. make a final comment? Because I know that like he had one, and you'll sure, have sure. one, sure. and you'll have one. So last round. So yeah, I, I, I actually I made point, my point already. Um, just make self-servicing and be servant to the people in your company and work with them together and teach them, but learn from them. You'll be surprised what they can teach you about writing good code for your exploit tools. You know, it came up, but they, they can definitely help you with that as well. I just want to highlight uh, something that Patrick alluded to and I talked about last night as well, which is you know, abstraction is a, is a hugely powerful thing um, and not, you know, not just in programming, but in the security space and operation space as well as uh, so at a previous time I worked with, uh, we had, we were running all windows and we had, I kid you not, 75 different system images we were managing. Yeah, because there was an image for this version of windows for this, you know, CPU type with a web server on it. And then there would be a one just like it that had a database and another one just like it that had an app server. Because we had zero abstraction of configuration management. Uh, we moved, eventually moved on, we started running things in the cloud, and we had one system image for Windows, one system image for Linux, for the Linux stuff, and then we used Puppet, and we had a bunch of Puppet manifests that defined what a web server looked like, what an app server looked like, what a database server looked like, and those manifests took care of all the dependencies and automatically updated things as appropriately, so now when there was a new you know, operating system patch, we had to, we would patch our one system image for Windows, our one system image for Linux, and then we would patch the live instances as opposed to going, okay, some poor bastard has to go sit down with all 75 images and fix them or create, recreate them with the patches and things like that. And that's where you start running into really long-term long, long -term problems is someone pulls the wrong image off the shelf and suddenly you have a Windows 2000 box running when you're only supposed to be running Windows 2008 and things like that. Uh, so you're ready, you get a huge scalability of well, you get a huge reduction of work right there just by doing some clean abstractions. And I think that, that along with the, with the cultural aspects makes such a huge difference from a security perspective. Um, so let's pass the mic around and see if there are any questions. Can somebody? Okay. Nice shirt. Okay. Um, where do you guys tend to draw the line uh, between the sort of provisioning side and the configuration management side? So let's just take recent tool, like have you guys used Docker? Yeah, so something like Docker where you have, you know, the little script file where you build up an image and then you've got your configuration management tool set. I'm just curious, where do you guys kind of, I, I think there's, it's very discretionary, but where do you guys tend to draw the line in practice? I think provisioning is for the first install and configuration management is for the rest of the life cycle. 
That's the way how I think about it. But you can use a config management to do the initial provisioning. Um, the parallel I make is when you raise a child, um, it's not only interesting during the first year of having a child. You have to maintain it through the whole life cycle. And that's the hard part. It's when they grow up and they have problems and become legacy <laughs> that you actually need those tools the most. Okay, let me just use your analogy, right? So <laughs> with something like Docker, you're basically killing your children and replacing them with new ones. Yeah? So uh, it depends on you set up. Like, I understand there's a, you can do a, a fast cycling of new versioning so that you're just provisioning every time again on a change. Uh, that can work for some systems, but not for all. And especially often the systems that involve data are hard to continuously provision. Um, but there is a tendency of rebuilding the system uh, every time over and over again. Uh, it saves some problems, but it doesn't solve all problems. Okay. Oh, I'll try. Uh, <laughs> so Docker is a newest tool that basically allows you to deploy. You can start with like a base image, um, and it it's like it's container level sort of virtualization. So it's it's kernel level, um, and you have these thin images. And as you layer them up, uh, you just pull down what you need, you add the things, and then you can push that back. It's, it's a bit like a code repo. You can push back that image. Other people can download that image. And it's a crazy fast way of deploying services in kind of constellations quickly. I mean, I, I would call it a, a package root system or package jail system from the BSD world. I mean, yeah. it's, it's much more complex than that, but the sort of, you know, you know, 30 second summary. Uh, I, some, last night someone talked about uh, that a lot, in operations we tend to treat servers as pets um, and we should treat them like, in a lot of cases, we should treat them like cattle. And I think where you draw the line there is going to depend heavily on the culture of your environment and what the actual system is. Uh, when, you have an, when you have an application that scales horizontally very well, it's much easier to treat your, your, your uh, individual components as cattle. Uh, when you have a, a application that's very fragile and you're relying on serious hardware to keep yourself reliable, then you really end up you know, treating them like children or pets, uh, or both, and depending on you know, how well behaved your children are. Yeah. Makes sense. Anybody else? Let's make Trey run. Um, in, in my previous job, uh, we used Puppet to, to manage the configuration files of the configuration of our server, but we had trouble managing patch. Um, how do you deploy patches? Some system requires to be really up to date regarding that, and some other are more uh, sensible to patch updates. So, um, I mean, how, how do you? Uh, are you flexible in the way you deploy patches on your system? So, did so, you get that? Yeah, um, it's about how you treat patches and how you manage upgrades of security things and stuff. So I have a lot of environments where we try to do continuous delivery and part of that is actually having tests in place for all moving components. And a lot of the reasons why people don't dare to implement patches and security updates is because they're afraid of breaking stuff. So if you have a continuous delivery or deployment pipeline and a life cycle, one of the things you can do is update all the patches on your test environment. And if your tests are still successful, you can move on. And then there's different approaches. Um, one of the approaches we do is we have different repositories and we manage the repositories based on which environment they are in. So a package, if for example, using Puppet, there is always ensure latest but latest can only point to one repository and that's a repository which has been tested. Or other alternatives are that you hard specify the version of which package you want and have that installed. But it can all be controlled from config management. That's one of the approaches on how you could do this. Yeah, so, so a lot of these tools, they install latest by default, but when you say a package of version, you can pinpoint it to a version. Obviously, you, 
spending the time of pinpointing the version of all packages on the systems is, is a, a lot of work and it's not really recommended. But you, you usually know when you know your application where it's most vulnerable of certain updates and so on, and you start controlling those things. I'm not saying it's the only thing. You should complement it with a test strategy and so on. But um, the good thing is, um, if you think about these scripts are version controlling the way a system gets installed, um, one of the things in a, in a software world where you actually freeze the world and change the application. In a systems world, you do the different thing. The world changes all the time and you keep the system the same. So what does require you is that you start version controlling the world around it, which it's hard to do, like you can't control. But for example, instead of just doing an app get update, you can make sure that you've frozen the packages that it gets from your repo. So every system gets the same version. So it's just one example of how you start controlling your environment on changes. You can't control anything or everything, like you can't control whatever is sent on the wire or how the machine ends up in a certain state, but you have to be aware of your external dependencies. The same with APIs to the cloud or whatever system, be aware that they change. If you think they have a big impact on your change, start version controlling them and specifying them in your configuration management. Otherwise, it might just, like, who version controls uh, OpenSSL? Anybody? Well, if that breaks, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of systems that will actually have a good cause, but it has such a good reputation of just updating to latest that people kind of tend to shy away from tracking it. But, you know, it's, it's a thin line because for controlling the whole OS with all the libraries, with all the application dependencies, that's going to drive you crazy. And there is something to be said on the approach of the, the containers where you actually freeze the whole OS as one image to a certain state. Uh, that's another approach, but once the system's running, it's in a changeable state all the time. So you still have to maintain it. Uh, Patrick? That's the first thing I remember hearing anybody say positive about OpenSSL in a long time. Yeah. Okay. You have another question or you had a come? I was just going to say, um, I'll add that we talked about the technical, I'll add the cultural, right? Um, patch management at some large enterprises can be a real shit storm, right? You've got a CSO, you've got all these other people in a, in a room arguing. When you start to embrace DevOps, uh, risk management and security as part of that, it's agreed upon. And it's great for risk management to come in because they can help with the prioritization and say, okay, look, from whatever, whether it's compliance and regulatory or whether it's availability or, or you know, these are the ones that we want as part of the conversation. Security architecture, it's the same thing. Um, and it is much more of a collaborative effort. It's not, it's not always smooth sailing, it's not always the Brady Bunch, right? But it's, um, it, it does allow you to have the conversations when many times it, it, it's extremely antagonistic without that cultural shift. All right, with that, we'll go to our next question. Contestant. No. <laughs> um, I love configuration management and what they bring in terms of security. Worked with them for a long time. But certain configuration management have a major Achilles heel in the fact that every system that's under configuration management has to have, or by default gets access to all attributes stored in the configuration management. So if you make the mistake of storing a password for a database server in configuration management and a web server gets compromised, which never happens. That web server can actually get that database password, which it's not supposed to have. So have you found ways of, of dealing with that? Um, I know you're referring to Shav as a tool, but uh, what I know in, in, in Puppet is that you, is you actually have um, like ACLs on whatever files you're sharing that you can set persistent. It's not the same as the searches you do in the databags to get your information on all the systems, 
but for example, one system cannot get to the file share of a key. Uh, it's, it's one approach, um, but then, um, like, in a way, they need to talk together because the one system has to rely on the information of the other system, um, but if it exposed too much, I guess with the current state, you'll end up um, having managing, with your config management, a config management server and do it separate per system. Um, one other approach that I have um, seen people use is doing away with the management server altogether and just running Puppet in a local only mode where you push the relevant stuff out and that lives on the client, but it doesn't have any connection to the database. I mean, the, the thing is anytime you centralize anything from a security perspective, I, I mean, you're, you're taking on, some, you're, you're shifting the risk around. Uh, you know, when you have an auto, a centralized automation server, whether that's single sign-on or a chef or a puppet or anything, you're, yeah, you're now giving yourself a big juicy target um, for, for the malicious people to go after. Um, and so that's something you do want to consider and you want to make sure you lock the snot of that, you know, really lock that server down, really secure that and monitor that heavily because you've just created a, not a single point of failure, but a central point of failure or attack. I mean, it's just like a CA. You really, cover, you really protect your CA if you're doing that sort of X509 stuff or SSL stuff because that's where the juicy bits are. But at least that's a known known. What's your alternative? Have a bunch of unknowns, right? I'd rather have a known known weakness that I can manage to than, well, I don't know, we're too scared of moving forward, you know? Uh, no, no, there's a lot of aspects in DevOps that if you talk to a traditional security guy, um, go straight against his intuition. Some Aren't you the guy who declared the S in DevOps as security? I think I was being trolled, but I didn't quite parse it. Yeah. Change is hard. <laughs> I mean, I mean that's, I mean that's, I mean math is also hard. Uh, you know, I've been doing security for almost 20 years, and it's really hard to shift from a all change is evil perspective to change is in inevitable. What can I do to to minimize the pain of that change, uh, both in terms of my personal pain, but also pain for the organization and make this as smooth as, as possible while remaining, remaining to whatever definition of secure you have. Um, and DevOps really, at, when you start reading a lot of the, the publicity about it, um, when you start reading about Netflix and Etsy and things like that, it sounds like, holy crap, they got rid of all of the security. When you first, like, when you first, like, you read the headlines, read the blurbs, developers are shoving code to production, you know, and then you say, and then, uh, you know, I talk to a bunch of people and they're like, oh my God, separation of duties is gone. Well, no, it's not gone. It's now automated. You know, you, you still don't have developers logging into production systems, changing code. There's still, there's actually more code review going on than in a traditional environment. Uh, you have better auditing and logging and monitoring of those changes to a much finer grained degree when you're using automated systems. It's actually being enforced as opposed to a lot of organizations that say they have the checks in place, but it's just basically paper checks and nothing else. Um, on, on your practical note, how to protect it, you might be able um, to query, uh, because all these tools are kind of REST-based asking things back, like just put a filtering proxy that allows you to kind of put some information back to one or not the other. Um, um, the way you make it sound is that the tools can't do it, so uh, configuration management sucks. Uh, I think what we need is people like you that actually get into, point it out, and make it better. Uh, but it's not that it's impossible to, it's not a, let's say, an architectural design flaw. It's just that these tools are young and catching up and starting to be used for a lot of new cases uh, that this is continuous like improvement of these tools. So um, we're going to need to wrap this up pretty soon. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Just a quick one. Do you have any tips for the pain period of migrating from the current environment into a DevOps environment. I think Brooklyn is already teaching you lots of beer. 
to bond with the developers and the other people you are sharing the pain with. So you're saying we should drink with the developers? So, yes. so drink with your developers? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Introducing DevOps is no different than introducing ITIL for the first time or introducing any kind of change. So look into the principles of introducing change into your company. Um, one of the things you often find is uh, make sure you have somebody higher up that backs you up. It's simple. It's the same with DevOps. Uh, make sure that you find the people that think the same in your company by hosting maybe some local stuff, drinking a beer, uh, doing a hackathon, and kind of build that. Once you are introducing that and it's getting some publicity in your company, what do you need to do? Uh, there will be people that will criticize it, really coolize it, and make sure that you don't proceed. Uh, make sure that you have progress and success. And that's the best way of improving it and introducing it. Um, if you stall at a certain moment and you get caught up in the fight of, uh, okay, well, let's do puppet or chef, and you know, you spend like three months discussing that, it will give you a bad name. It's like showing progress, building on successes, make sure people know the successes, and be open about the failures. And that's no different than introducing any change in an organizational level. And, and actually, in my experience, developers are the easiest group to get doing this, particularly if, it's a, if you're an agile-like organization. This is a very natural extension of that, and that's, that's the easiest sale. The hard sale is actually further up the food chain because you're, you're potentially breaking things. Uh, and there's a lot of research about this, like Alex was talking about failing fast, um, and I talked a bit about complexity last night. Um, but that's where, you're, where you're, it's the shift you need to make up the food chain. Generally, getting the developers is really easy. The ops folks and the security folks are the ones who you know, will flip out when you try to suggest this. Well, yeah, and one, to, that, to that extent, one thing that I did, I'll, I'll just give Gene Kim a little plug. Um, I got a handful of, um, he has the Phoenix Project, which is a book modeled after the theories of constraints book, The Goal, about DevOps. Um, and organizational change. Um, I actually bought books and gave them to senior managers. Yeah, right. So, you know, that, and, and in there, in the book, there's allusions, there's hints at an ability to make financial projections about quantitative money, dollar savings, right? And you can add to that risk management savings, um, you can add to that better managed risk. There, there's, a, there's a huge business case that someday somebody needs to, to really do some awesome case studies on um, for changing the culture to, to this sort of, of stronger process. But like, like we said, it's, it's new, right? And all you get are people like us going, it's awesome. Well, let's say on convincing operations people, um, the one thing that often comes up, the, or the first thing, we're gonna get out of a job and we need to do, like, people are gonna get fired. That's one of the arguments that comes up, or we're not developers. It's kind of the, every time the same thing that comes up. But once you tell them that um, they'll be able to get through their backlog, which they always have, <laughs> and they make it consistent so they have less issues, less fight, and so on, and that the stuff they can do is that they can finally move to the next level. That's kind of the compelling point. Obviously, there's people who don't want to go to the next level, who want to keep on doing, so it's hard to convince those. Um, on the security side, first thing comes up, it's like, oh, you give them access, we can't control it anymore, and so on, which is actually rubbish because it's becoming a more controlled process because it's automatable, measured, and so on. And as a bonus, what often convinces these people, okay, everything's running, you checked it, and so on, but there's a security breach. How long would it currently take you to fix that? And then light bulbs go off, and they say, okay, if you have all that chain and that pipeline there, we can put that out. All those patches that we've always dreamed of and have been telling these people to get out, and now they're actually getting out. 
and I don't have to nag about that. It's just in the mainstream process. So these are kind of the two topics that often come up, and that's the way I, they usually get tackled. Obviously, if people don't want to listen, yeah. But that's in all change management. Uh, how are we on time? It's pretty much time to wrap, right? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna, can I throw out my crazy cybernetic feedback loop thing? Go for it. That's just this crazy idea I've been talking with people about for a while. Um, anybody here know, like, fail to ban? Yeah? So, if you don't know, this is something that you can run, like, if you have a virtual server or something, it just watches for, like, multiple failed SSH attempts and will, like, add the IP, the source IP to your IP tables. So we send them into Logstash and then make graphs okay, out of this that is, this and is where be alerted I'm, on them. So, so contain yourself. The feedback loop. Contain yourself. <laughs> so I work for Splunk. That's a dirty vendor. I've handed many of you t-shirts. We try to sell a product and make money. And uh, I've had many, many conversations with Chris about Splunk versus Logstash. I don't care. I mean, I've been using Splunk since 2005. Before that, I we're not going to go there. Don't ignore the log, like logs, there's a lot of power in logs. I don't care what, I mean, on a certain level I care. But I don't want to go there. What, I don't want to go there. What I'm just trying to say is like, when you're monitoring and you have a system like Puppet, where rather than writing, say, a shell script to like, say you have a homogenous environment, I can write a shell script that can like, modify an ACL on a, a Cisco, uh, say border gateway, and then maybe I have some checkpoint, and maybe I have this, maybe I have that. Well, at, I'm more familiar on the Puppet side than with the other tools, but what they've done is partnered with different vendors to basically add support for those devices, whether it's on a storage level or a network level or like an enforcement type of thing. So using the resource, like the abstraction layer, you can make configuration changes like in a way that's way more easy to explain to your boss than just the shell script that I hacked together last night. And because it has this audit trail, if you're looking at your logs and you detect some type of aberrant behavior, think about the metaphor to uh, fail to ban, then you can move towards something like an active defense where you trigger configuration state changes throughout your environment and remove the human from the loop for certain use cases. So um, again, maybe again from Etsy, but for example, I know that during uh, a crash of their MySQL database, uh, they have their configuration management fix known states of problems. So it's all, you can use it not just putting your system live or managing your system, you can all also use it as a response system, as you say, the feedback loop to fix something. Because if you know that state and you can verify that state, why not automate the response? Because it takes the burden away. Uh, it doesn't mean that they run this script on every situation over their MySQL database, but if it's a known state and you can automate that and it brings the value of not having to page a person or fixing it, or maybe just notifying instead of alerting him, it totally makes sense. There is a downside in giving your example of fail to ban, it's an interesting denial of service attack. And whatever you automate, you can automate your problem, and so it's on a thousand machines. So it's the same thing. Uh, use it responsibly, uh, but be aware that whatever you propagate, uh, so maybe make it in segmentations and just do a small set, then a full set. It's kind of common knowledge, I guess. Uh, there, was a, there was a great tweet from Cloud Barat a while back saying, you know, to break one server you know, is, is human error. To break a thousand servers all the same way at the same time, that is DevOps. And, I mean, and that's true of any sort of configuration management, any sort of automation is you have to be really careful uh, you know, that if you, you can really screw yourself over at, at a very broad degree very effectively, but at least you're doing it all the same way. Um, and I, I said this last night, I will, I, I will happily deploy certain patches immediately upon getting them because I'd rather break the network in a way I understand rather than in a way that letting someone else do it in a way that I don't understand. Yeah. I think the problem is not that it goes on to a terrorism servers. Okay, you can mitigate it and so on. Um, again, coming back to the fast feedback is that knowing as fast as possible 
that you screwed up. That's another part of the important, is the resilience of putting something back or responding or being notified. Again, the feedback loop. So I don't think we're really <clears throat> at a level of maturity to, to take the human out of feedback loop in a lot of cases. But if you think back to the manufacturing metaphor, like a lot of uh, high quality manufacturing is done by robots now. And there was a day when somebody came to their boss and was like, hey, I think we should give this robot a cutting torch. And they were like, what? <clears throat> but now we're very comfortable with it. So I think we're not necessarily there yet, but this is where things are going. You know, in terms of like not screwing yourself in the foot, not screwing yourself in the foot, not shooting yourself <laughs> in the head. Or anyway, sorry, next metaphor. Um, like if you are, if you, we haven't really talked about monitoring, but if you're rolling something out and your monitoring checks start to fail and you can block it, then that's another approach. There's a, a, an interesting thought experiment you can do is that whenever you do a change on a system, whether it's a patch or a config change, um, ask yourself, how do I know whether it's successful? And you'll be surprised that it's actually often hard, but you would know what to do manually, log in, check maybe some processes, do a few tests, but make that repeatedly on a lot of systems. So even if you're not talking about monitoring uh, or uh, metrics uh, once it's running, how about a validation test at the end of your deployment? And think about that as unit tests for, or kind of a, a functional test after you're deployed. So a lot of these people uh, starting to experiment with config management is what they do is at the end of the run, they run a set of commands to know whether it's complete. Because lo and behold, config management can lie as well because you define what it checks. And if you define the wrong things, um, it might lie to you. So just. Yeah, I actually wanted to add uh, to the before you deploy, uh, one of the things that doesn't get, it's, it's finally getting talked about more is the idea of actually applying continuous integration tests and version control to your configuration management system. Uh, there's some great tools that have come out, uh, Salt Stack and uh, Kitchen Sink in particular, that will do automatic testing of your actual configuration management recipes and cookbooks so you know that what you have is at least syntactically correct and you're not gonna damage things nearly, you, it reduces the chance of damage. And you really wanna keep that stuff in version control so when you make a mistake and you need to roll back, you don't need to say, well, what changes did I make? I, you can revert the actual manifest or cookbooks and so then when you push it back, you know it's going back to a previously known state that you've already measured from the previous run. Yeah. Because I believe there's a difference between um, monitoring a system, which you can only do like a, a periodic check once so often, and between running um, a full check at the end. Uh, some checks are costly or have impact on the system, which you might don't want to run continuously in your check but it might make sense just to do them after your deployment. Um, and that's kind of the, the valuable thing, um, or the difference, I mean, between running the test or just keeping the monitoring up. All right, I think we've come to the end. We need to wrap up so the next session can begin. But before that, um, I know you all came in here right from lunch, and probably some of you have been recovering from your food coma. Has anyone noticed that um, Alex is modeling one of our new um, shirts? I just wanted to make sure you all caught that. So uh, Patrick, Chris, Alex, David, thank you very much. And thanks for giving me the chance to uh, participate in this with you. And uh, I'm sure we can continue in the hall. I can't believe you'd actually do that. I did it. I can't believe you won't do it. <laughs> Thank you.
normally. It's not sure if it's on. Ja, dat is goed. 